<laughs> you know, some mornings you just got to get up, get on with it, and get going. Mainly because you know that unless you start moving, you really aren't going to feel any better. And you know, sometimes that's a lesson to be learned. Man. A moving object is a lot easier to change direction and course than a stationary object to initiate movement. In other words, when you got to start something going, it's kind of hard to get it up off of its <laughs> rear end, so to speak, and get it on, on the road. The same thing's true about life in general, is that if you're moving in a certain direction and you know where you're going and you know where you're headed, then it's a lot easier to be motivated for it and to kind of get excited about what's going to happen. But if you really don't know what you're doing, you really have no idea. You get up and every day seems to be kind of, well, you know, I should do this, but maybe I'll do that, maybe I'll do this, maybe, maybe, maybe then it's kind of hard to get motivated. It's hard to see the end result. It's hard to know if you're heading in the right direction. God never intended his people to be directionless. As a matter of fact, Jesus made it a point of saying that we should know and we must know where we're headed or we'll just be tossed to and fro with every whim of doctrine that comes along. That you can often tell those kinds of people that are kind of like, they jump on the bandwagon for the latest news story that comes along. <gasps> oh no, the sky is falling. Or they jump on the bandwagon for the latest political hero. Oh no, they fell for grace. Or they jump on the bandwagon for the latest gossip. Oh no, our movie star just got divorced. Or they jump on the bandwagon for the latest government statement. Oh no, the economy is falling apart. <laughs> God never intended us to be living our lives that way, where we're jumping to and fro and up and down and all around trying to figure out what's going on in this town, but in the life that you live. Because God intended for you to live a life of fellowship, of relationship, of uh, continuing on with Him in a personal and intimate way. <laughs> he didn't want you to live every day bummed out. As a matter of fact, he wanted you to live each day in love with him. And kind of part of that is going through some of the struggles you go through, but what he does in those struggles is he brings you closer to him so he can hug you. You know, Benny Hester used to sing a song that he's going to squeeze you just because he loves you. And uh, that's about the size of it, really, is that your life is going to go kind of crazy at times, but you have an assurance from God that he's going to bring you from point A to point Z <laughs> and you are going to be made perfect in his sight. Because, you see, in his mind, you're already done. You know, he took care of it a long time ago. He died on the cross, man, you're perfect. But in your perspective, no, you're not perfect. And everybody around you can tell you that. Him? <laughs> yeah, right. Sure he is. <laughs> but you're being changed. You're being, the word is conformed. And the reason why we use the word conformed is because he's forming you, just like clay. You know, he's taking this kind of dumpy looking, you know, mucky, mushy kind of movable object and throws a little water on it and then starts forming you. He starts taking that clay and bringing it upward, you know, into a vessel. He wants to make something out of you. And then he puts his hands down in and he starts to push in as it spins around and you're going, I can't see left from right and up from down because I'm spinning around and around and around and around. But he knows what he's doing when he takes his hand and then he brings the, all the inside and he takes his fingers up from the inside of that clay that's spinning around and that vessel that is going to become. And then he takes his hands and begins to squeeze it a little bit and brings it up higher and all that splop down kind of hooky little junk that you used to be kind of becomes this tall shapely vessel that he's chosen for it to become something that he's decided now admittedly you could be a vessel of you know wrath and he might not make you into something you know that you want to be if you don't kind of cooperate with the process but you could be a vessel of honor and once he 
takes that vessel, you know, that, that form that he's made you into, you know, he's, he's brought it up, he's kind of formed it, then he takes off the wheel, you know, that you've been spinning around going, man, I can't tell up from down, up from right, and where I'm going. Then he puts you in kind of a situation of life, you know, that you grow and he fires up the furnace and puts you in it, you know, so that you would bake. <laughs> You've been there. You'd go through trials, fiery trials that, you know, he would kind of make that clay into something solid. So eventually he could pour his Holy Spirit inside and so he could pour his love inside. He could pour his peace inside because, you see, he wants it kind of to, to be a vessel that he could use for his purposes to touch other people's lives. But until you go through the process, you know, you really aren't worth all that much yet. You know, you kind of got to go through what God's doing with you in your life in order to get where he wants you to be so that you can become what he intended you to be. If you resist the process, well, you know, <laughs> he'll take that clump of clay and splat it down back on the wheel and keep splatting it down until he can work it out. I know when I was working with clay, you had to keep working it and putting water in it and kind of getting all of the impurities out, you know. Well, once you did, then God could use you. God's promises will be fulfilled. Little children, you are of God. You belong to him and have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist. Because he who lives in you is greater and mightier than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. So, you see, it's what's in you that's greater, not you are greater. Once you've been formed, you know, into the vessel he wants you to be, then he, inside of you, can operate freely. Know you are in Christ and understand that through salvation you are seen in the spiritual world as wearing a garment of salvation and covered with a robe of righteousness. See Isaiah 61.10. God is on your side and he is under you. He is over you. He is around you. He is with you. He is for you. And he is in you. Do we leave anything out? <laughs> I think God's got it covered, don't you? And what are you worried about? The devil knows you belong to Christ because God has also appropriated and acknowledged us by putting his seal upon us and giving us his Holy Spirit in our hearts as the security deposit and guarantee of the fulfillment of his promise. So it's like, if you know you got the Holy Spirit inside and you know you got at least half a monochrome of common sense, then you kind of know that God is working out in your life the eventual end of your life, that you will be presented before him holy and acceptable, that he is the perfecter of our faith, not we. It's not a question of us running around going, oh, oh, oh I got great faith. Oh, yeah, baby, watch this. <laughs> be thou gone. <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> Back on the potter's wheel. Throw that clay back down there. We need to work it out a better way. He got a little too high up there. You know, we need to reduce him down to a coffee cup size. <laughs> but the realization of who is doing the work is almost as important as what the work is. Because it's not us, lest we should boast. But it's what Jesus has done, Jesus is doing, and what Jesus will do in you, for you, to you, by you and through you to all others around you. So it's really all about him. And I'll admit, it's a lot about you and me. And doesn't that kind of give you a reassurance today to go forward and not worry about what others may say? <laughs> it does me. <mean. laughs>